Now we're going to enter into uh, session 19. Okay, let's move forward to the uh, host section 19, the quantum, uh, secure quantum computing. I'm Zhao Long Guo from Kansas State University. I'm a session chair for uh, the following uh, three presentations. Uh, the first speaker is Sanji uh, uh, Dapandai. And Sanji is a second year PhD student at Yale University, advised by Professor Jacob Seifer. His uh, PhD research is focused on secure and efficient hardware architectures for post-quantum cryptography algorithms and quantum computer security. Before starting his PhD, Sanji was working as a research associate at the computer architecture and security labs in EE department at Yale University. And his presentation title today is Design of Quantum Computer uh, uh, anti-virus. Let's welcome our speaker. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, hi, I'm Sanjay, and uh, my talk is about design of uh, quantum computer antivirus. Um, this is a joint effort along with my uh, colleagues from Yale, uh, Chuan Chi, Theodorus, Yongshan, and Jakub, and with our collaborators from MIT, Hanrui, and Song. A uh, brief outline on uh, how the talk is structured. I'll st start with uh, the motivation behind our project, talk about some relevant background, uh, show some existing work and how we improve that, talk about the wider circuits as well as uh, then show our quantum computer antivirus that we designed. So the motivation behind our project is uh, that the quantum computing is an exciting new paradigm of computation. Uh, which can solve, uh, potentially solve hard problems which are classically difficult. Researchers across the uh, world in industry and academia are working towards building large-scale quantum computers with sufficient qubits to make this, uh, uh, this goal possible. Um, in the light of growing sizes of quantum computers, um, several research uh, have been proposed for uh, multi-programming schemes. These schemes uh, envision um, that multiple users can run uh, their quantum programs in the same quantum computer um, in parallel. So the existing quantum computers are susceptible to various kinds of uh, errors. Um, and out of uh, different errors, such as gate errors, uh, decoherence, and crosstalk, crosstalk presents an interesting uh, security vulnerability in the multiprogramming mode of quantum computer. And we'll look into that in detail. So in this work, we explore uh, the existing work from the literature on the crosstalk-based attacks in the multiprogramming setup, then propose and improve the methods on the similar attacks, and then propose and implement an antivirus to, to thwart such attacks. So a quick background on, on, on crosstalk. So crosstalk is the effect um, of uh, performing a computation on one or more qubits, which um, intentionally or unintentionally affecting one or more um, other qubits. Um, so based on how the qubits are arranged, signal intended uh, for one qubit may affect other qubits through crosstalk. Uh, let's look at it uh, with the help of uh, an example. So on the top left is the um, coupling map for uh, IBM Q Lima, um, and uh, bottom is the, is the quantum circuit that we want to run um, on this device. So the first three qubits, Q0, Q1, and Q2, is a quantum half adder that we want to, to run, and then uh, the Q3 and Q4 uh, are just a series of C0 gates. Um, so works from Gauche et al. Uh, shows that um, like the circuit that is placed on uh, qubits 3 and 4, which is the series of C0, uh, uh, series of C0 gates, can have a neg negative effect on the computation that is happening on 0, 1, and 2. And this is due to the crosstalk. And uh, the effect of this is maximum when it is uh, uh, the series of C0 gates. So with that, um, then uh, we try to apply that to the, the multi-tenant environments, where uh, a, back, a quick a background on the multi-tenant environments is that in, in a single-tenant environment, um, the uh, um, user can run one program um, on one quantum computer at a single time, then the qubits are reset, 
the next program logs in and, uh, and, and that is run and, and that's how it works. But in a multi-tenant setup, multiple programs can run in parallel. Um, as multiple users can use uh, different parts of the, the, the quantum computer, like individual qubits or a couple of them or, or three of them um, in parallel. So in this setup, um, the crosstalk attack can present a challenge. So with that in mind, we, we uh, design our experimental setup. Um, so we fix uh, Q0 and Q1 here uh, to our victim circuit, uh, any selected circuit, and Q2 and Q3 to the virus circuit. The virus or malicious circuit here, we define it uh, as a circuit that, that causes um, crosstalk. So we quantify the effect, the amount of crosstalk based on uh, how much um, reduction on output uh, probability is seen on the victim circuit. Um, the experiment here is that we increase the number of virus circuits, uh, um, the gates in the virus circuit, and then observe how it affects um, the target circuit. Um, for these experiments, we use the IBM Fiskit framework, um, and with that, uh, we start our experimentation. So for the initial experimentation, we try to replicate what Ghosh et al. did in their work, just uh, with the, the Grover's um, algorithm circuit. So we fix Q0 and Q1 here to the Grover circuit, um, which, for which we expect the output probability to be P original. And then for Q2 and Q3, we just use a series of C0 gates. So the, the way the Qiskit uh, compilation or the transpilation process works is that we, you specify the, uh, the input circuit, and then it undergoes a series of optimizations and decomposition and translation to the basis gates, in which these series of C0 gates, which, for which the control uh, line is same, just gets optimized and uh, just get uh, decomposed. So when the transpilation process is completed, you just get to see a delay value uh, and all the, on all the C0 gates are lost um, in this translation. Um, and when it is odd number of gates, you just see one C0 gate at the end. So with that, uh, since it gets optimized before uh, running on the quantum computer, uh, that you don't see any change in the output probability after the measurement. So we improve on this approach by adding uh, something called delay functions between the C0 gates, which, with which we were able to trick the transpile function to assume those as individual separate gates. And post-transpilation, we could still see that the C0 gates were in, uh, still in place. Um, so with that, um, when we run, uh, we see that the measurement output, uh, which uh, was supposed to be 1, 1 for the Grover circuit in this case, uh, we see that there was a drop in the output probability uh, when we performed the measurement uh, with the C0 gets running in parallel. So now that we have a, a trick um, uh, to, to design uh, our uh, um, virus circuits, so with that, uh, now we choose uh, different uh, victim circuits to, to try this on. So the first one, as I demonstrated, was the Grover circuit, uh, which provides uh, a quadratic speed up in an unstructured search. Um, the attack here, um, as I mentioned, is to lower the correct output probability and increase the, the random output. Um, on a larger scale, Grover's uh, circuit has uh, applications um, in problems like traveling salesmen and deadlock prevention. So if the attack is successful, then um, uh, in, a, in a larger scale, uh, uh, these kind of algorithms um, uh, could be affected. The, the second uh, victim circuit that we choose is the uh, deutsch josa um, algorithm which determines if a given oracle is uh, constant or balanced. Um, the attack here is to identify a balanced oracle as a, as a constant one. And uh, the third is the, the Bernstein-Vazirani circuit, um, which finds out a hidden string with a single query to oracle. And uh, the attack here is to retrieve incorrect uh, secret string um, at the output. And in all the cases with the preliminary uh, experimentation, as we can see, uh, that we were able to reduce uh, the output uh, probability, the correct output probability by s some margin. Um, with that, then we design various uh, virus circuits that we want to try on these victim circuits. Uh, V1 is just the, the uh, one uh, that we got from the Ghosh et al. Um, so I'd like to highlight that it is still possible to run this uh, C0, uh, series of C0 gates but you have to manually disable this optimization that, uh, um, that the transpiler has, and then uh, it's, it's possible to, to run V1 as well. And for all the, the rest are the, the virus circuits that we designed, uh, and um, 
So we, we chose uh, two qubit, uh, three qubit, as well as a single qubit uh, gates for, for this uh, analysis. Um, then looking at the results uh, for the Grover circuit, uh, we were able to see uh, uh, that there was a um, um, significant decrease in the, the output probability uh, for some and for some, uh, uh, for, for the larger, uh, uh, like V9 and V10, which were the, the three qubit uh, and four qubit uh, uh, virus circuits, we, weren't, uh, we didn't see much because I think the spacing between the uh, the C0 gates was uh, was uh, higher in that case. Um, and for our uh, V1 to V8, we used uh, the IBM Q Lima, which is a five qubit machine. And uh, for V9 and V10, we used uh, we use IBM Q Casablanca, which is a seven qubit quantum machine. Um, the the X axis here represents uh, the, which is uh, DT, which is uh, in time, it's, um, it's two pi five uh, nanoseconds. Uh, we see a similar kind of results um, for uh, Deutsch Choza as well as Bernstein Vazirani um, algorithms as well. In addition to this, we also tried for additional um, um, algorithms, which we specify in detail um, in, in our paper. In the interest of time, I chose just to use the results from these three. Um, so since we see that uh, um, from this analysis that these uh, attacks were uh, possible successfully, um, so to, to stop that or to identify virus circuits early, we designed this antivirus uh, for quantum computers. So, um, so how does it work? So we, we just specify the quantum circuit and the pattern to be tested as an input to our uh, antivirus uh, software, uh, which uh, converts this quantum circuit object to a directed acyclic graph with non-commutative uh, uh, representation. Um, this uh, then finds a pattern using a uh, uh, subgraph isomorphism algorithm and checks uh, if the, the mappings are exact. Um, at the end, uh, the, the results um, show that uh, where the pattern was observed on which qubit, as well as uh, we also get to see uh, the number of times a, a certain pattern has, has uh, appeared on, on a certain qubit. And based on that, uh, a user can decide whether uh, the detect detected uh, pattern is a virus um, or not. Um, so assuming that um, uh, the attacker has uh, a capability of just bypassing the, the antivirus, if we just run it by, by default, uh, we provide two different uh, uh, recommendations of how we can run our antivirus software. The first one is that uh, um, we run this uh, antivirus software along with the, the compilation or the transpilation part um, on the cloud provider's end. So a uh, local user would just submit the, the circuit and all the, the transpilation happens on the, on the end of the cloud provider and a check is performed. Um, and then uh, it's run on the quantum machine and then uh, the results are returned back. Uh, and an alternative uh, to that, if to run locally, we also um, provide uh, a compiler uh, uh, support that, that can run um, inside a uh, trusted execution environment. And for our evaluation, we chose uh, to run it inside the Intel SGX um, using, um, uh, using Grameen. So, uh, and in, in this case, after running uh, the, the compilation, uh, we add a uh, attestation note in addition to the circuit, which can be verified over uh, at the cloud provider's end. And then uh, uh, make sure that it was uh, executed inside the, the trusted execution environment. Uh, we evaluated uh, the circuits, uh, um, like 10 different uh, uh, virus circuits along all our uh, victim circuits. And we found 100% uh, of uh, uh, accuracy in detection of uh, the patterns. Um, and yeah, with that, uh, I'd like to, to conclude my talk uh, by saying, uh, we've demonstrated uh, the crosstalk based attacks on quantum computer in a multi tenant setup. We presented a novel uh, hardware architecture for detecting such virus circuits. And then we also evaluated the performance of the, of the antivirus with and without uh, Intel SGX uh, enclaves. You know, following are the, the references that I've used. And uh, here is the link for our uh, repository where we have the software code available publicly. Uh, thank you. Any questions from audience? Hi, Jim Squalik, uh, UNAM. 
So what is inherent about the CNOT gate that is so effective, right, at creating interference or crosstalk? Um, you're probably not a, like a quantum physics expert here, but why are CNOTs, right, the virus of choice here? Um, what's, what's, what's special about them? So from with my limited understanding, uh, what I know is that the, the pulses that are required to, to run C0 gates are like um, multiple of those when compared to like a single C, uh, qubit gate. Yeah. So those are, uh, so I, I understand that those are more effective in, in causing uh, crosstalk than the other uh, single qubit gates. I see. Hmm. So would it be effective to you got a multi-tenant system to just try to decide if someone is using C not gates, right, for computation. I mean, uh, or would they be computing? <laughs> they so just use C not. So there have been uh, so so the the works uh, that are out there. They recommend that uh, doing uh, while running uh, uh, C not gates uh, to to schedule them uh, in a way that uh, it don't it doesn't interfere. But that has to uh, there there are schedulers which do that for you. Yeah. which doesn't run in parallel with the, the other circuits. Right. So but that may in, uh, increase the, the delay of the overall circuit right. in general. And in, in terms of the multi-tenant setup, the recommendations are um, like not to run two circuits in, par uh, in parallel, right. rather leave a qubit in between two circuits, and that would reduce the overall effect. Yeah, agreed. OK, thank you. Two slides, uh, pre two, two slides previous of this. Yeah, here uh, you you have a block for SGX, and you it seems that you run your compiler that uh, checks the maybe the uh, mod your model if there is a virus, that's your antivirus. But how do you protect your runtime? Because even if you do not have a virus in the source file, it doesn't mean that it can be. Uh, inserted into the model that you have in memory. Uh, so, so the idea behind this was uh, that we have some uh, the, the the antivirus software has these um, kind of circuits um, which create this crosstalk on the um, and so they, they would identify them early, like the, the software would identify them early, even on the local machine, and would not allow you to to send these circuits. To the uh, to the cloud providers end, and if they if you are able to send, which means that uh, it has passed through the checks that the antivirus provides, and it adds this attestation, which is then verified uh, on the cloud providers end. So and th that's right. But my point is, uh, you have your model, you send it to your runtime, yes, and the, the and the, the model can be modified before it gets to the quantum computer. Then probably you should. Uh, extend the region that you run your SGX. Your runtime should also be protected. Um, interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sure. Thanks. OK, thank you. Thank you, our speaker again. Okay. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Kathleen Smith. Dr. Kathleen Smith is currently a quantum so uh, software manager at Inflation. Pre previously, she was an IBM postdoctoral scholar in the University of uh, Chicago's Department of uh, Computer Science, advised by Professor Fred Chong. In January of 20, uh, uh, 2024, she will join the Northwestern University Department of uh, Computer Science as an assistant professor. Congratulations. And uh, her topic today is the fast fingerprinting of cloud-based 
NISQ quantum computers. Let's welcome the three speakers. Hi, everyone. Um, so I just want to kind of address the elephant in the room, you know, uh, quantum computers. We have NISQ computers today. Those are noisy intermediate scale quantum devices. Uh, if they're so early, if they're prototype devices, which they are, um, why should we think about security? Well, we should be thinking about security because they're on the cloud already. And if security is not paramount, then we're going to be setting ourselves up for disaster later. Um, so today I'm talking about uh, ways that we can fingerprint or identify quantum devices in the cloud. You know, it's a, a first step to hopefully developing secure protocols. Um, and hopefully that'll be with a lot of collaboration with folks in the room today. Um, so I'd like to thank my collaborators. So we had a, a range of, of um, scientists working on this project, some at University of Chicago, um, Duke, uh, Yale, and of course, Inflection. So let's discuss today's status of quantum devices. We have a lot of very promising prototypes that are emerging out of both academic and industry labs. A lot of research dollars are going into these devices. So we should be thinking about security when we're thinking about these devices. Um, to kind of give a little bit of insight of how these devices operate, it's very sporadic. Um, so we've got some example technology featured here. These are, and as a disclaimer, this talk is going to really focus on the IBM family of quantum devices, but these, these, um, these techniques will extend to other technologies as well. So we're going to focus on the fixed frequency transmon. And when we look at these devices, we have about uh, 100 qubits, some more. We have some roadmaps predicting uh, thousands of qubits in the near term. Um, but these devices are very um, error prone. They have high error rates as of now. We're almost at the thresholds needed for some implementations of fault tolerant error correcting codes. Uh, but we still have a little bit of ways to go, and especially in terms of scaling these devices up into more qubits. Our coherence windows are limited. Um, and they happen to change day to day. So we can see that pictured here on the right side of this slide where we have coherence time recorded for three different devices that look exactly the same on the surface level, but they operate at a very different heartbeat. Um, so we can see that even from calibration to calibration, that T2 time um, or coherence time that gives us insight to the way that, that each qubit can, um, can contain and hold phase information, it changes and it fluctuates. So we have a lot of uh, variability day to day um, and some properties more variable than others. So each quantum device has this property signature that's unique today. Um, we are having, there's a lot of research efforts to make these devices more homo homogenous as we move into the future so we can um, be able to adopt these error correcting codes. But right now we have a lot of variation um, that we see in our devices. And of course right here at the bottom left we have a picture of an IBM quantum computer, one of which is actually on the quantum cloud today. So for the foreseeable future, um, unless you're an academic institution, a national lab, you will be uh, uh, you will be using a quantum device through the quantum cloud. Or this will be more of a hybrid cloud because quantum devices do need a, a substantial amount of classical support infrastructure. Um, so whenever we have these these different devices that are available in the quantum cloud in the future, a lot of them are going to be targeted towards very sensitive applications. So we're thinking about cryptography applications, sensing applications, financial modeling, et cetera. And a lot of research dollars are going to go into developing these algorithms that will be run on these machines. Um, so when we think about that, we think about these highly sensitive applications on these devices, uh, we want to make sure that we are targeting the correct device and that we are running um, our algorithm on the device that we anticipate. So how can we identify these quantum resources? So this insight that um, we have fingerprints in our classical hardware security tool belt, uh, can we apply that to the quantum space? So the proposal that we had in this work was to use intrinsic randomness of a quantum device, uh, something that was specific to each instance of quantum hardware that we could use as a fingerprint for identification. So we needed to pick out of that property signature which ones were going to be stable and reliable enough for us to identify that device over time and distinguish it among its neighboring devices. So we decided to use variation as a strength. And here we looked at how um, very commonly, like we, we saw inspiration from the, our, our, our classical fingerprinting uh, uh, literature that we can use um, 
intrinsic properties that appear during fabrication. So uh, our fixed frequency devices and a lot of other um, superconducting and circuit-based quantum technologies, um, they do depend on um, fabrication steps that are done in layers. So we have our substrate cleaning, our metal placement, lithography, just injunction definition, packaging and final test. And all of these introduce opportunities for defects to be injected into our quantum devices. And of course, those defects uh, lead to irregularities that we see during performance. So we can see that, how our fabrication steps lead to a quantum device, and that quantum device has unique properties um, because of those stochastic impurities that are injected at time of fabrication. So we are going to use those, those variations as a way to identify our quantum devices. Uh, so to begin, we need to, to have a data-driven um, analysis that led us to the particular features that we could use to identify quantum devices. Um, so since the IBM devices on the quantum cloud have been available, uh, you can go and you can scrape the data from all these machines, which we did, and found thousands, uh, tens of thousands of records that we were able to clean to perform analysis to see what features over time would be reliable for us. Uh, now there's a couple of things that are important to us. We are motivated to discover not only identifiable features, but features that transcend revision. So we have these different revisions of processors, so going from a Falcon class to a Hummingbird class to an Eagle class. So these are our devices that um, as we go up in our, our processor uh, class, we're able to have more qubits per device. We wanted to make sure that these um, identification techniques were going to be able to uh, be used between these different revisions um, in these processor families. There's also updates among the different types of processors, so we might have different revisions uh, and updates within a Falcon class of a, or a Falcon processor family. Um, so we had a lot of um, different insights that we found, which are detailed in the paper. I won't go into depth here, but we saw that there's a lot of properties that tended to change from processor family uh, to processor generation. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we, we filtered out those different properties in the property signature to focus on those ones that were constant over time. Um, we also wanted to make sure that um, those features that transcended re revision were also ones that um, we could use in a scalable manner. So even if the device grew in size, we wanted to make sure that this identification and fingerprinting technique was going to be reliable for us. Um, so here we can see a feature that is not going to be a good candidate, so um, C0 infidelity. Uh, we have a lot of overlap with those error rates, and this is just a, um, gives you insight to the overall statistics of going from a 27 qubit machine to a one, or 65 qubit machine to a 127 qubit machine. Um, there's a lot of overlap, so not a really good feature that we want to use because we want something that'll be a bit more collision resistant um, and a lot less variation day to day, which we also saw that the CX infidelity or the C0 infidelity was highly variable day to day when you looked at those calibration records. So that led us to develop a scheme that um, essentially looks at the um, normalized calendar uh, or the, the normalized distance between the different features to see which ones are going to be um, uh, the Hamming distance between the different features to make, make sure that we had ones that were not only distinct, but they're collision resistant and reliable over time. Um, so we can see two features at the left, um, one that would be eligible to be part of our uh, device fingerprint and the other that would not. Um, so we see that qubit frequency is very stable over time. Uh, over uh, more than 800 calibration cycles, we see very little variation. Um, however, when we look at the one qubit error rate, uh, we see a lot of day-to-day -day variation in that uh, qubit's um, uh, infidelity. So we would not want to use that as a basis for our fingerprint. So picture to the right, we have our uh, inter and intra quantum uh, device feature distance. So these include information for three five qubit machines. And we see that um, frequency, as opposed to uh, coherence time T1, T2, and readout error, um, has a lot of uh, those desirable features of being distinct, being collision resistant, and reliable over time. And we can especially see the reliability over time in this second analysis where we look at larger machines and we see that um, the distance between calibration cycles um, is very low, so we have consistency over time. However, our distances between devices is very high and that's something that is very desirable for a hardware-based fingerprint. So 
once we have this hardware-based fingerprint, applications, of course, lead us to uh, think about how we can use this in, as a basis for a physically unclonable function that protects quantum resources deployed potentially in untrusted environments and validates the origin of quantum de de results. So what is, the, what is the importance of this? Um, quantum devices are very hard to verify, to certify quantumness. Essentially, uh, we've probably seen a lot of these different um, publications, especially out of Google, their quantum advantage experiment. Um, so we want to make sure that we, we if, the, if the results are very hard to, to verify, we want to make sure that we're actually getting results from a real quantum machine and not a random number generator in the cloud that was uh, essentially a, um, a, uh, a malicious party in the middle type of attack. So we want to make sure that um, we use this as a way to, to um, fingerprint and identify our, our uh, device um, so we know that we are talking to the, the, the quantum machine that we reserved and uh, that our results are actually coming from a quantum device, especially if we paid top research dollars to um, generate these circuits that we're running on this cloud-based hardware. So next steps, and this is kind of uh, where we are at currently, is developing this challenge response framework uh, that employs hardware fingerprints. Uh, so here, the frequency-based fingerprint, there's also other different features that we've explored and identified as viable fingerprints uh, for transmon-based devices. Um, and we use these in a way to generate many keys for authentication based on a unique physical attributes. And these results, or these responses, will, will result from a one-way mapping that combines those challenges and that intrinsic property, uh, such as frequency, that we've identified as a reliable identifier. Um, so, of course, this uh, challenge response uh, function must be collision resistant and nearly impossible to learn a copy. And further, we would like to have it be a basis of certifying quantumness of our quantum device. So if we were able to do these types of challenge response um, routines in situ during our quantum computation, we'd be able to not only identify our quantum device, but identify that we're actually getting quantum responses. Um, so kind of a mini quantum advantage experiment while your quantum algorithm is running in place. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for their time and open it up for questions. Any questions from audience? Uh, I have a quick question. So how can these technicals could be extended to the, the other platforms like some other fixed frequency platform uh, qubits? Yes, um, so we did focus on the uh, fixed frequency transmon, and one of the things that was really important to us was to pick a uh, intrinsic property of the QPU as opposed to any sort of classical peripheral so it couldn't be removed easily. Um, but if we wanted to extend this to other, so there's a lot of other different um, circuit-based technologies and, and um, uh, superconducting based technology. So going from maybe the fixed frequency to tunable flux, there's still a range of frequencies that are associated with the qubit, and that is because of um, variation that's in the Joseph injunction. Um, so that would so that would be uh, a, a different feature that we would still kind of consider a candidate as a, a feature we could use for fingerprinting. Um, but the essentially the the this, the technique that we use of uh, taking a survey of a bunch of different properties that define a, a device's property signature and then um, calculating distances over time um, on device and across devices, uh, that would still be a very viable technique um, to find out which elements are eligible to be fingerprint information. Oh, thanks. Um, so authentication, right? I mean, so we need a strong puff of some sorts, right? Yes, and because that is a big open-ended question. <laughs> right, I mean, CMOS <clears throat> devices achieve that by having lots and lots of wires and lots and gates. Here you're gonna be fairly restricted, right, in terms of the number of components that you would have to build a strong puff from, right? So I guess these qubits, I mean, I can imagine they have lots of things, right, that vary, right? Um, so what is entropy? Entropy is sort of a fixed source, right? It's a baked in source that you can depend on, right? Um, across time and across environments and so on. So what do you, um, so how many different parameters do you think you might be able to leverage, right? Um, like from one qubit, uh, do you have any idea about how many sources of variation 
right? Um, we call it entropy, right? Um, um, yeah, no, that's a good point. So, so the thing is, it's, it's trying to not, you know, trying to make sure that there's challenge response architecture. And I'm pretty new to this space too, so I'm okay. still learning too, so I apologize if I say something that's a little naive or completely obvious to everyone <laughs> in the room. Um, but we wanna try to figure out in a way to probe these devices where we're not inserting extra free variables. So one thing we could do is we could come up with a special way to probe the, the qubit. So for the transmon devices, um, you essentially probe them, for a single qubit gate, you probe them with a drag pulse, a microwave pulse that uh, resonates with that qubit for a particular lo amount of time to um, essentially instantiate that particular qubit rotation you want. Um, or a two qubit gate, you wanna do a cross resonance interaction for a fixed frequency transmon device. Um, so maybe if you go outside of the native gate set and have like this is a particular um, type of, of um, uh, calibrated pulse that's just used for authentication, we could do that. Or maybe just have dummy qubits that aren't used for computation and are just used as the like device's identifier yeah, potentially, okay. if there's enough space. Yeah, so. understood. Thanks. Thank you, that was a good question. Hi, um, I just, just question about the, the, the noise of the, the responses that you might get. Um, have you done, uh, is this, is, have you done any experiments yet on, on um, synthesizing some early responses and finding out how much noise is you're, you're, you're getting from your uh, responses or has that not been, been done yet? Oh, the noise from the responses for, yes. for, for just the frequency, it's relatively low noise just because um, you just do a frequency sweep experiment. So you just have your, um, essentially you have like all these drag pulses at different microwave frequencies and like whenever one resonates closest with your qubit, you get the strongest response back. Um, so that's relatively uh, low overhead in the sense that there's little room for error and, it, but in terms of the other properties, there are a little bit, or like the T2 experiments and the different gates that you implement, um, like a miscalibrated gate could could also like if inflate your gate error, which would make it a little unreliable. But um, there's still a lot of work to be done, and that's why I think frequency was, what, since it's very simple to characterize, um, but there could potentially be a lot of other different elements that we look for as well. Okay, so, so do you envisage having so the end product being a clean, um, a clean repeatable key or a response that you can sort of classify as close enough to what you would expect and then yeah, you, you authenticate on that? Um, I think probably something that was close enough to, like low enough distance from your expected response, um, just because right now we're primarily looking at just trying to identify the devices, um, but coming up with keys, um, so there's another like whole realm of like, you know, you, if you're paying a lot to develop these algorithms, you certainly wouldn't want your competitor to scoop them up through like a, um, a, a person in the middle attack, so you want to like try to make, so maybe key generation would be the next step to make sure that um, you could transmit your results securely. But yeah, so identification at the bow first. Cool, great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Just a quick question. On your plots, uh, you showed some uh, boxes, I think, and probably referring to uh, average, uh, maybe some upper limit, lower limit, and maybe some upper percentile and lower one. And can you explain what are those for? Oh, yes. Um, so these are just kind of um, part of our analysis that we looked in. So these are just uh, run-of-the-mill block box, uh, like box and whisker plots. Um, so here, the, the primary purpose of this is just to show like the large amount of um, uh, overlap between the, um, the distributions associated with the small, medium, and large quantum devices, quantum devices that are, were available at time of writing. Um, so, of course, since the distributions are all kind of gathered in one, so all of the, so we have the median, um, and then the upper and lower quartile, and then, of course, the, um, we've got the, uh, um, the flyers on there. So we've got the, um, the distributions marked here that really don't give insight to, like, the, in, they, they give the distribution for the individual qubit values for, um, to, like, the CX infidelity. Um, but this is just to show that there's a lot of overlap among those different devices and that over time, uh, or not over time, um, or yes, over time, they're like kind of, they change day to day. And then um, as we go from like smaller device to larger device, uh, we see that mean kind of go up, which is described a little bit more in the paper. I might've glossed over this description a bit too much in uh, the talk. <laughs> sure, but how can this distribution help? 
oh, it just gives insight to the operation characteristics of the device. So this isn't particularly, so this, this particular feature, the, the two qubit C naught infidelity, was deemed to be an, a, not a great candidate for our fingerprint just because there was a lot of, um, there's, a, there's a high collision um, between the different sizes of the devices and there was a lot of variation day to day um, going from zero to, like from a, a total of like 13 calibration cycles. Thanks. Thank you. Time is limited, so let's thank uh, Kathleen's uh, exciting talk. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Our last talk is given by Daniel Vela. He is a PhD candidate at the University of Florida. Daniel's research center uh, focuses on hardness of the power of today's noise quantum computers, which are error prone. His work is focused on developing practical applications that can run on those devices, uh, despite uh, their uh, imperfections. Specifically, Daniel is exploring the use of open quantum systems and other methods to enhance the resilience of a quantum algorithm to errors, while also looking at the ways to exploit the quantum uh, ma mechanical uh, phenomena for inherent robustness. That's, that's very interesting. So his talk today is towards secure classical uh, quantum systems. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so yeah, thank you for tuning into the talk. Um, kind of the goal for, for me today is to try to describe this holistic view of quantum computing. Um, kind of also remind that classical computing and devices plays a very important role in enabling these quantum systems. And then kind of also talk about kind of what are the security implications both on the classical side and the quantum side. Um, this work was done in collaboration with uh, two of my colleagues, Tali and Nashmin. And kind of as introduced, I'm, I'm more of a kind of quantum quantum person. So uh, towards the end, if you have questions about, questions about the classical side, I may have to uh, use a call a colleague pass. So forgive me on that. Um, well, without further ado, uh, kind of the talk is organized. First, I'll just kind of bring a brief introduction to quantum computing. And then I'll talk about the classical side and the quantum side and the securities associated with those. So here's some pictures of quantum computers. Um, the first one on the left is from 2000, uh, 2004, and this is around the scale of two micrometers. This is a superconducting qubit. Uh, the second image is IBM's um, five qubit machine, also superconducting qubit based. Now this is at scale of about uh, 300 micrometers, and for perspective, the size of a human hair is about 50 micrometers. And then uh, the last one is a trapped ion quantum computer based on these two naturally occurring um, atoms, strontium and calcium. And kind of the goal of this was to just demonstrate that uh, quantum computers are real quantum systems and kind of what some of the engineering goals is to either create our own quantum systems which we can control and manipulate or kind of rely on nature to give us that kind of quantum, mechan quantum mechanical system that we can control. So there's a kind of a fun fact is that qubits are getting larger in size, um, kind of as I <laughs> alluded is, you know, on the left-hand side, we have a small quantum computer of about 2.5 micrometers, while uh, the second one is around 300. And you know, why is that? And well, it's because we have to make a trade-off. Um, uh, quantum computers, we have to be able to control them, so we have to have classical lines that connect to the quantum computer. But we also want the quantum computer to be isolated. And so we have to make a trade off between those two. And, and kind of currently, I think we found that having a larger qubit um, meets that kind of trade off. Um, and then, you know, there's some other descriptions here. So this is a uh, Google's quantum computer, um, you know, this dilution refrigerator that cools the quantum computer to about two millikelvin, really close to zero. Um, the quantum computer sits at the bottom of this. And there's a bunch of classical wires that go down this dilution refrigerator, which control the quantum computer. And you can kind of see in the background, there's a lot of classical computing devices that send pulses and control that quantum computer itself. Um, so what is a qubit? Uh, well, a qubit, uh, you can view it as a vector. So zero, ket zero is a, just a 
that first vector and then ket one is the second vector. And in a general, a qubit can be in a kind of linear combination of both, or as known as superposition. And that's characterized by two um, kind of coefficients, complex coefficients, alpha and beta. And kind of one of the properties is that when you measure the qubit, uh, the, the qubit collapses, so it'll be, it has to collapse to either zero, which is ket this one, this first vector, or it collapses to ket one, which is the second vector. And each of those collapses is associated with probability, uh, alpha squared, so that alpha squared collapses to zero, and beta squared collapses to one. So you have to have, these coefficients have to conserve probability. Um, so brief intuition, if I confuse people, um, so I like to just kind of provide my own analogy. Uh, you can think of a quantum computer kind of as a rocket flying in space. The rocket has a state, which is its position and velocity at any moment in time. This is how you know where it is and kind of what it, where it will be in the future. Um, and you can also think of kind of noise, hands, noise canceling headphones, which is described by complex number. And noise canceling headphones can cancel out noise uh, by exploiting the properties of waves, constructive and deconstructive interference. So kind of my analogy is to think of both of these at the same time, and that's kind of what a computer is, quantum computer is. Um, kind of now to further kind of characterize the difference between classical and quantum, um, in classical computing, we like to write our like logic in terms of gates, and we can represent that circuit, gate circuit, as a truth table where we, where we have inputs and outputs. Um, and kind of one of the properties is that at any given moment, we're only in one row of that truth table. Quantum computer, similarly, we can describe it in terms of a quantum circuit with gates, uh, where we start at some initial state and we kind of uh, evolve the quantum computer in time using these gates to arrive at some final state that we want that encodes some solution to our problem. And uh, we can represent that operation using a unitary matrix that is applied onto a vector. And kind of the main differences here uh, between classical and quantum world is that first, the quantum computer can basically be in all of these rows at once with some probability, unlike in the classical part where we are in one fixed one row. Uh, the second kind of difference is that there's no distinction between input and output in the quantum computer. Um, there's, you know, if I give you the final state on a quantum computer, I go backwards in the quantum circuit and I can give you what your initial state was. That's kind of reversibility. So there's no distinction between uh, input and output. It's just you have a set of qubits that evolve in time. Uh, okay, so now I'll kind of talk about the classical and, and the security vulnerabilities and the quantum security vulnerabilities. So um, as alluded before in, in the previous talks, uh, quantum computing is, will most likely exist on the cloud. So you have a cloud component where your kind of laptop you know, sends jobs to some cloud provider. Um, and in that cloud provider, uh, the cloud provider has its own classical computers that process that information and send pulses to the quantum computer. And each of those stages has its own kind of security implications and vulnerabilities. All right, so classical and quantum. Um, so for example, um, if we talk about a kind of a cloud setup, uh, your laptop, you know, ideally if you have some job you want to do, you would like no one else to know what that job is. So you would encrypt that and you would send that encrypted data to the cloud and the cloud would probably decrypt it and then run that on your computer. Well that, you know, has, um, as probably many of us know, that has a lot of uh, implications when you have some kind of secret key that you're sharing. So for example, you know, you can attack, with, you know, look at the power radiated from either the server or on, the, on your laptop to see can you extract the key and that you can, um, you know, gain information on what the results were or what you're, what you're asking the quantum computer to do. You know, our famous uh, power, electromagnetic radiation, and even timing attacks. Um, you know, kind of a second one, which is uh, the work done by my colleague Tao, was, uh, you know, maybe your server, you know, you might trust a server, but it has someone or some uh, nefarious attacker uh, tampered with the circuit or the accelerators that are used on that on the cloud computer. Um, and so in his work he uh, you know talked about power injection. Um, you know, can you can maybe you can escalate some of those privileges on your on your on the server side um, and kind of gain root uh, authority, for example. And as well as some others, you know, uh, clock injection, EM fault injection, and laser fault injection. Um, so kind of, um, you know, I mentioned encryption, we would like to encrypt the data, um, but we might know that quantum computers uh, have 
are kind of one of the things that people are scared about quantum computers is, is that they're able to crack some of our classical encryption schemes. And this is thanks to Shor's algorithm, which solves a number of, uh, for example, RSA encryption and elliptic curve cryptography um, uh, in kind of, in, in logarithmic time, basically. Um, so the top, top uh, is the fastest known classical algorithm, while the bottom is the complexity of Shor's algorithm. And kind of the threat is, you know, it might not, quantum computers aren't at the size that it needs to be to run Shor's algorithm, but the threat is, you know, if you store data now, harvest now, then in the future, perhaps you could decrypt later and you could figure out some of those secret computations that we were doing today. And to address this, um, the field of post-quantum cryptography was born, and in 2016, NIST called for a contest to, you know, can we develop some algorithms and encryption schemes that are resilient to quantum computers? And so this was kind of the timeline, and towards the end, there were like four candidate algorithms that came out um, that are resilient to quantum computers, and particularly Shor's algorithm. Um, you know, here's another kind of timeline of some of these kind of security levels, and uh, you know, wh what were the winners? Now, unfortunately, um, you know, NIST when they asked for uh, quantum uh, post-quantum cryptography algorithms, there are two requirements. It has to be both secure against quantum computers, but it also has to be secure against classical computers. And unfortunately, as with many things on classical computers, uh, you know, the implementation of your, of your cryptographic algorithm is uh, you know, not super robust and can be prone to side channel uh, attacks and leakage. So you can bypass some of the uh, encryption schemes just by looking through, going through the side channel. And uh, so um, here's kind of a bunch of different side channel attacks that were explored. Um, and kind of my favorite one here, and not to talk about all of them, but it's this number theoretic transform. And this is kind of the mathematical foundation that um, enables all these post quantum cryptography schemes. Um, basically, it's similar, you know, one of the main computational components is you need to multiply two large polynomials. And uh, naively, you could do long multiplication, which is O of n squared. But if you do this number theoretic transform, which is similar to fast Fourier transform, you can speed that up to n log n. Um, but that is itself prone to many side channel attacks. Um, and so uh, that's why it's almost everywhere here. And um, you know, one of the strategies to metagata is to use a masked kind of r randomly add noise to the computation of uh, the number theoretic transform, and that's called uh, you know, masking, and it's common in even uh, classical security algorithms. Uh, unfortunately, though, um, as kind of my colleague Nash Nashmin demonstrated, is that, um, and others, that deep learning frameworks can actually extract that randomness that you've added and overcome these, uh, you know, these security, uh, uh, additional security th things that we've added. Um, so kind of the work that she looked into was, you know, maybe let's look at the implementation at the RTL, and at the RTL level, let's try to add uh, some uh, benefits. So I, I would, I, I kind of breezed over this stuff here, but I would re uh, refer you to our paper where we talk about some of the details. Now, um, let's get kind of to the security of uh, quantum devices, and this was alluded to in kind of some of the previous talks. Um, so this, one possible attack vector is when you send pulses to the quantum device itself, right? So you're sending some electrical magnetic wave that tells the qubit what to do. Um, and as an example here, this is a silicon double quantum dot. Um, you know, it basically the way it works is you trap two electrons uh, um, on kind of the left and the right, and those are controlled by these L and R probes, which try to confine that one electron and you kind of build this barrier, uh, which is here, using another electrode, uh, G. So you can control the size of that barrier, you can kind of control how much these two qubits talk. Um, but all of these things, all these electrodes, you have to send electromagnetic pulse to kind of calibrate and make sure oh, there's two electrons at all times and tune what kind of gates happen. Um, and here's kind of just an example of how that works. Um, suppose you wanted to implement a C-naught gate, which is a unitary gate. Um, I'm just playing an animation of some pulses that over time you implement that uh, two qubit gate, T naught gate. Um, so, you know, that's one vulnerability in the way kind of uh, 
kind of, I mentioned in the paper, I uh, referred to that, but one strategy is to, in addition to trying to enhance the, uh, enable the quantum gate to do that functionality you wanted to do, you also optimize for leakage. So in addition, you try to avoid high amplitude, um, high amplitude, like see how it jumps, you try to avoid those. You try to make a pulse such that it's very uh, uniform. So that's one way to avoid uh, EM leakage that you can detect on the, on, the, on the pulse, on the classical side. Now kind of to get into the, some intrinsic quantum security vulnerabilities, um, and this was the first talk today, um, one, one kind of avenue is, um, is kind of insecure reset. So one of the functionalities of quantum computer is that every, every time you want to run a computation, you have to start at an, an initial state, which is that ket zero. Um, now, unfortunately, as kind of demonstrated in this, uh, in this Jakob uh, Schaeffer's group, is that you can extract some of the information because the quantum computer wasn't able to fully reset. Um, so you can extract some information, figure out what was the computation performed before that reset. And the reason why that happens is because most architectures, you don't actually measure the qubit itself. Uh, so let's say your qubit is red. You actually go through another quantum device kind of quant that couples with that qubit and then you measure that detector. So it's, it, it's, there's a proxy stage, right? And some of that information might not have been fully dissipated uh, in that interaction. And that's why you, you have kind of faulty resets. And you can see that here, um, this is kind of showing how many times do you do the consecutive resets. You can see that uh, when you first reset it, you have, you have high variability. You didn't reset it fully. And that's kind of the work uh, uh, Jacob's group did is, uh, hey, we can extract some of that information. And their proposed countermeasure was, well, uh, you know, reset it several times and they showed that you, uh, their machine learning algorithm couldn't uh, pick up on that extra information. Um, now kind of, um, this alludes to some of the work I've done, um, which you can find in this preprint here, which is, well, let's take advantage of this architecture that's present on most quantum computers, which is, let's take advantage of this detector qubit and this qubit and make the uh, kind of exploit the entropy of, of, the, cu of the detector qubit to prepare the qubit uh, itself. And it's a co convoluted way, um, but it's essentially kind of exploiting that uh, when, you, when you have two particles that are entangled and you measure one of them, there's a back action that occurs on, on one of the, on the other particle. Um, this is kind of the property of entanglement, so in this work I kind of exploited that and showed a way that you can initialize a, any arbitrary state you want to, um, starting from any unknown state, using just a simple uh, repeat, and reset, and measure. Um, and finally, uh, as, as the first talk gave, is there's a problem of crosstalk, and it's, it's uh, um, you know, a problem on certain architectures, such as superconducting qubits, and uh, some of the proposed strategies is as well, let's you know, try to avoid, develop a compiler which avoids some of these, um, tries to minimize the use of crosstalk and CNOT gates, and this can be done using uh, kind of pulse, pulse optimization as done in this paper. Um, without further ado, uh, thank you for tuning into the talk and thank you for the organizers. from audience? Uh, I have a quick question. For the quantum system vulnerability, what will be the attack surface? So how the attacker can, can trigger the vulnerabilities? Uh, so, sorry, could you repeat the first part? For the quantum system vulnerability. Quantum. System vulnerability. Okay. How the attacker can trigger or exploit the, those vulnerabilities? Um, yeah, so uh, for example, uh, if you have kind of faulty reset, um, what, uh, what you can do is you can kind of ex extract some of the information that's not, f the state wasn't fully reset, so there's still an extra bit of information that's left over. And uh, kind of the, what this first paper did, Jakob's group did is, well, they trained a machine learning uh, model that kind of tried to map back that extra information to the original, whatever the person ran before that. So they figured out, hey, you ran this quantum circuit before that just by using the little extra information that was left, left over from the insecure reset. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions?
Um, so let's thank Stanley again for his presentation. Yeah, so actually this concludes our morning sessions and we have